Customers first. Hey everybody, my name is Jamie Balcom. I actually am from the great state of Michigan. Uh, I live in Iowa now. I have been doing ministry for a long time, well, many, many years of youth and sports, and a couple years ago I took a break. And So I grew up in the Reformed Church of America, a small little town called Conklin, Michigan, maybe a population of a couple hundred people, and I came to faith really early on. I knew God was calling me at a very young age, like six, seven years old, and Throughout the years, I would fight him and say, no, and I don't want to do anything for you and do ministry because I always thought my friends made fun of me, so I didn't do it until I was older. And then when I got older and was doing youth ministry, God won, and I went back to school and got my degree in youth and sports ministry, and that's where I am. And the last couple of years, I've taken a few years off to do a hiatus and do some new stuff, and, and I'm beginning to look at what it looks like to start a new ministry and call the Feed the Flock or Feed His Flock. And I will, me and Andrew will talk about that more in a few minutes. Hey everybody, welcome back. We are trying to stay consistent and do every week. We've got schedule changes coming up, so hopefully that's going to be happening. But today... We have a guest that has been a long time coming because he was actually, he was one of the first people, I don't even know if you remember this, Jamie, or not. He originally was one that we had looked at at co-hosting before we even launched. I do remember. And then he was going to be doing his own thing for a while, and then that didn't pan out either, but he's finally here. We, we had back. recorded it. Those that followed us here from the CSRM podcast back you know, many years ago was we started. He and I had recorded together a couple of times for the CSRM podcast. But now we're finally able to do it for the, the Misfits podcast. So, Jamie Balcom, welcome. Hey, buddy. Glad to be here. Yes. So, it's been a long time coming. We finally have you here. Let's start out with a little bit of why it's been a long time coming in terms of how you and I actually know each other and and what it is that you've been we've been trying to get going for a while here. So, who is Jamie? Yeah, it's just it's been a transition for me in in life the last couple of years. Uh, you know, all the years of doing ministry and sports ministry, I just I took a break. I needed time away from doing ministry and, and now it's like, okay, God's been pulling and he's fighting and it's like, okay. And then, then my boy Andrew reached out to me. So I'm like, okay, God, this is what it is and let's get going. So I'm in. So here we are right now. So I'm, I'm the one that's pushing. No goody. Um, that's good. Yeah. So, so for those that don't know, Jamie is a former CSRM board member. He um, is one that ha he and I, so I don't know how long we've actually known each other now because I don't remember how long I've been involved with CSRM, but we've yeah, known each other for a while. He, he and I have been both involved in multiple plannings of things. And unfortunately, he and I also are two of the type, I mean, there's a reason why he was going to be able to fit right in with the Misfits moniker right away. Both of us have a tendency to want to vision cast. It's part of the gift giftings that we've been given. Both of us also have a tendency to uh, not necessarily fit the mold of the people that want to hear a vision casted to them. Would that be a correct way of yeah, saying that's, it? That's an exact great way of saying it. Yeah. That's so we, we've run into a few roadblocks here and there, but... Jamie now is coming because he is ready to start casting a new vision and one that is in early, early planning stages, but it's far enough along that we want him to come and talk and see if, see what, what can be done to help move that process along. And we're going to get to that here in a little bit, but first I want to talk about something else that we've, we've hinted at before in other episodes, but this is one of the times where we actually have a guest that I know is going to be able to actually break this down a little bit easier. Let's talk a little bit about this whole needing to take a break, but not being allowed to type of situation. 
going on? Because this is something that, you know, you, you, I, anybody that has listened to us for a while has heard me say is that there is no such thing as part-time ministry. <laughs> and there is also no such thing as actually being able to retire from it. That's correct. And so I, I just actually had this discussion with a guy online the other day that he's like, I'm done dealing, doing church stuff. I'm ready to go look for another job. You know, how easy is this going to be? And a lot of the other people in this group were like, oh, you know, it's just a matter of changing your resume and things like that. And I'm like, well, no, 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 dude, you don't understand what's about to happen here because you're going to go find another job and just be like, what is happening? Why are people thinking the way they're thinking? Why are people doing what they're doing? This is not how we're supposed to be treating people. And he didn't, he kind of knew what I was talking about, but not quite. Everybody else in the group was just looking at me funny. Let, let's actually walk through this whole thing a little bit before we get into how we got to where we're at today and what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time. So, Jamie, you talked about the fact that you just needed a break for a little bit. <laughs> Walk us through that process of recognize, first of all, recognizing it and then actually acting upon it. What is that kind of, what was the process there? Uh, it's just, you know, like I said, I had been doing it for 26 years, you know, like 26 years. Um, I moved out to Iowa to take on a job to to do youth and sports to continue it with a good friend of mine who's a senior pastor of the church I worked at. And, you know, and there's always them issues that people like, they don't like certain topics, you know, youth ministry, like you move into, I like literally moved into a small town where things don't happen. Our kids don't do that. That kind of stuff doesn't happen mm -hmm. here. You shouldn't talk about the them controversial topics with our kids and and just different stuff and just issues, you know, and like the issues aren't even the chill, the kids, the students, it's the parents more and more the parents just, I mean, I've done it for 26 years. I was a paramedic in there. So there was nothing, there was no topic off limits for me. There was nothing I had never seen before. And, and it just got to that point where like, okay, I just need a break. I am, I'm burned out. I've been, people have accused me of stuff that's never happened. They always do that. It's, it's part of ministry. And, I finally just like, I need to take a break. I need to step away from ministry. And I literally walked away from the church. Uh, I took six months before I even stepped back into church again. It was right after COVID. I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going back into a church. I don't want to go. I was very angry at things that have gone down. But also part of it was I need to just, I need to separate myself and go to church again where it wasn't a job. Church is church now, you know, and, and we began to go to this new church and like uh, two years ago, three years ago, and the senior pastor ended up being my cousin out here in Iowa. Like my third cousin didn't realize it till he said where he was from in the sermon. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm related to him. And my wife's like, no way. I'm like, dude, he's my cousin. He sure is. And then we started going, we've been going there for about six months and seven months that time. And Tim, the pastor's like, hey, I want you to go down a mission trip to Compton. I know what you're doing. I know you're trying to just be a number. He's been really, they're really cool about the upper, the people at the church. They knew who I was. It's a neighboring town, so they knew who I was. But the staff understood, and we get to California, and Tim's like, Jamie, I can't have you be just a number in our church. You know, I'm like, he's like, you're, you're too valuable to me and what you know to do stuff. And I'm like, Tim, I'm just not ready. And I kept, I just was like, I was like, okay, let's start doing a little bit. So I went out, you know, I did the mission trip. That's a start for me. Like, I was trying to avoid that stuff and then like about a year and a half ago he was like okay or a year oh no in the last year i i took on a new job uh, working with one of my good friends from churches he does construction which i did a long time ago in the summer when i wasn't farming and uh and my boss just decided you know he's like hey you gotta you gotta stop pushing you gotta stop fighting you know and then all of a sudden my boss tells me hey i'm gonna go become a missionary in a year in a year and a half so they started this pro they're in this process now and i'm like okay god and he's been like jimmy you got to stop being angry with god i wasn't really angry because i was and tim finally put me like, jimmy you got to let the anger go it wasn't anger necessarily with god but the church too and just anger and so last year i started teaching middle schoolers again i forgot you know after a five-year hiatus i'm like what the heck is this and i forgot how crazy middle schoolers <laughs> are and it's a completely different generation now than when you you left yeah right so i started teaching helping because i didn't want to step on our youth pastor's feet you know that we have and i was like hey i'll help and so i started and i've been on like three or four mission trips to compton which will lead to where i'm going in next and we'll talk about that with the idea in a few minutes but 
it's just that transition of like, I just needed to stop. I needed to step away, focus on my kids and just, and just did that. And now I'm in a place again where I'm like, okay, God, like we're having this constant dialogue, me and God every day of arguing and not arguing while I argue. He tried, I, instead of listen half time, I just argue with what he's trying to tell me. And it's getting to that point where I'm like, okay, if this is what you want, then let's figure this out. You know, in a year, in like literally a year from now, I won't have a job. And cause, so it's like, okay, do I transition? And I'm getting that like, okay, I feel like I've had my break. I've separated. Okay. Do I want to work in a church or do I want to do this other thing? And that's where, that's where we're at today. It's just, so, it's just a process. Like people need to understand, like you can get burned out quickly in a, doing ministry. Yeah. But how do you recognize that is the hard part. And that's part of why I wanted to get to is the how do we recognize that? Because I think there are there are a couple of things you said that we need to break down a little bit because this is where the confusion comes in a lot of the time. Is mm-hmm. one of the things you said was that part of why you just needed out was that there were there there was just nonsense going on is the best way to put it. There was nonsense going on. There were accusations being thrown around. There were rumors being spread. There were people that were upset because you were actually talking to their kids. All these sort of things going on. And that's why you're like, okay, I'm done. Right. Because we're, I mean, we're not it's doing more this like, anymore. I look at youth ministry totally different now that I've been a youth ministry is more of counseling. Now you're more of a counselor than you are anything else. So, you know, the leadership and the teachings need to come from the home. You know, we're just there as a person to walk alongside your parents, but also these kids need a place to vent, open up, you know, and, and you know, if you had to like, my rule was with, cause I was a paramedic, I've seen it all. My rule with the kids were you have 24 hours, you tell me something. And if you're either hurting yourself, or harming yourself mm-hmm. or others, you have 24 hours to go tell your parents. But the thing is, like, I'm, like most other youth pastors, like, I'm the first one, like, I will walk with you through this process. I will stand there with you, tell your parents, I will sit in that meeting. I will get them to understand what's going on, you know, and then you get to some of the parents, like, my kids don't do that. And then the minute their kids do it, they don't want to believe it. And it's right. like, try, and then they're like, oh, you're counseling my kid through this. Well, what are they doing? Well, part of it is they have to tell you, you know, I give them the time and then it just continues on and just trying to understand what's going on. But also there's parents that don't want to hear it. And, and that that's part of where my next question was going with is, do you feel like, because I well contrast that with what you just talked about as far as both with your boss and the pastor that you have now of where you said the, the things that was time, they time. wanted to give you time. Mm-hmm. They wanted to allow you a chance to to do it very much. Actually, they're they're doing exactly what you said you were trying to do with the youth kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, they it's want just you that. to be able to. Do it. And do you do you feel like part of the <laughs> difference between what you are ready to go do now and why you walked away, you know, five years ago is an easier way to kind of define it would be is the, the support level of the network mm-hmm. more so than it is actually the job. Yeah. That too. That's a lot part of it too. And like, as you say that, yeah, the support level, but it's also, it's allowed me to like, I mean, I'll show you, uh, it'll be part of when I tell you what's going on, what I've been doing the last five years here when we get to that. But it's like, I've been allowed to like get, cause I was angry with God over the whole thing. I'm like, okay, dude, I've been doing this for 26 years. At what point? Plus, I'm like, I'm a dinosaur in youth ministry. I did it for 26 years, you know, like, <laughs> holy cow. And then I'm like, but then, like, now as I started this fall, this spring, I started helping the middle schoolers. I'm like, okay, this is what, this is who I am. This is who God's made me to be. There's no doubt about that. Like, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I was, like, nervous at first diving back in because they gave me all the brainiac kids, you know, all the smart ones. And I just went right after them and challenged them. And I was like, oh, and, you know, like, this year they're already like, we only want Jamie to teach us. We don't want anybody else teaching us. And I'm like okay, I guess I'm all in again for a year. And it's like, but I'm, I'm in a good place to go in and do it. Like I have the support, like all the kids in my group, I know their parents really well now. And, you know, it's just that I'm to that point. I'm like, okay, God, let's, let's go. And first off, we need to point out that people are going to look at the screen now and be like, how has, how had he been in for 26 years and calling himself well, a dinosaur? With teenagers, you say, young. yes, I am almost 50 years old, but I yeah, tribute to he, working with kids all the time. It, and that and the food you're eating, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, you know, that, that sort of, st- yeah, 
people don't believe it. And and th- and and here's part of the other thing that people also need to understand when as we move through with all this, because they're probably all like you said he was a you know a builder and he's just doing basic youth ministry stuff. Go back and we'll we'll link it. You should listen to some of the episodes that he and I recorded with the CSRM podcast stuff. This guy was building building wiffle ball fields out of out of nothing. Out of nothing. And doing full leagues every summer. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like he was just sitting around doing youth ministry. He was, no, was which is that, that, and you can't just sit around and do youth ministry. Don't take that the wrong. I'm saying it was much more than just he was doing youth ministry. Right. Now, the other thing involved with all of this that we're getting to is that you know the the other phrase that you used a couple of times here, and this is one that gets misused and misunderstood a lot of the time by people that especially people that have been hurt by the church from a ministry role, but have never actually served in that role themselves to actually know what we mean when we say this. So the phrase that you used and that your pastor had used is mad at God. You're saying, yes, I was mad at God. Absolutely. What does that actually mean? I didn't know where things were going. I was struggling with like, okay, what's up? And like, why is this happening? Why am I going through this again? Or why am I going through this? And then, you know, it's all like, what am I doing? What, I, what, why are, what am I doing? And then, who do, you know, who do you take it out on? There's nobody there to take it out on. Once you leave, you take it out on God. And, you know, it's like, it's kind of like when, here's, I don't know if this is the best way, but it's like when somebody dies, except there's still a person. <laughs> you know, it's that ending. It's that closure. There's yeah. a closure without a closure. Like, you know, you just, there was never closure. Like I still see the student, I still see students I used to work with and they're still calling me all the time to talk to them. So there's no end, but also it's just like, like, it's just like, okay, God, I don't know what you want. What do you want? And, and the time, the waiting, the waiting times where you get frustrated. Like, okay, God, what do you want? Do I want to do that? Do I, what, what do you want me to do? Where am I? Cause then that transition point, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I have a family to take care of, you know, and just the waiting. I'm not a waiter. So that's where the frustration comes in for me is just like, okay, what do you want? What are we doing? Let's go. I'm not waiting. You know, that's a constant argument I have with him all the time because I'm not a sit still guy. I don't want to wait. I'm like, let's go. What's next? You know, you talk about we're visionary people like, okay, what's next? And that that's what, you know, before we even get to what's next, the flip side of that is what you also had said related to it in terms of the fact that you're saying I was mad at the church, but I was also mad at God. And that's where the problem comes in for a lot of people is that you either hear from one extreme the, you know, well, you're mad at the church, so you shouldn't be mad at God because God is so good. So you just need to find a different church. Right. That wasn't it for me. Or Or on the flip side, you have the other extreme of, well, if you're mad at the church or if you're mad at the church then you need to just be done with the church and go away from it and be mad at god because god the church is god and so that that's right. the problem no that wasn't that's, neither of those things are where we're at with what we're talking about here and that's right. part of why i wanted you to be the one to help me right. walk through it because this is no. part of what it's you know i don't know if if you how much pay, attention you've paid because you've been very busy a lot of the audience that we have within misfits are people that are in that exact spot of where they have left the church due to something. Right. But they don't want to leave God behind. Right. And so they are saying, yes, I'm mad at the church. I'm not mm-hmm. mad at God. Other people are telling them though, no, you're mad at God and you need to just love the church. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that most of us are actually in a different spot completely where the anger is being directed at God for the way that the people that were supposed to represent him acted. Mm -hmm. Oh, how have you walked through navigating that? Because we've, we've said it on here before and we'll make it very clear again. We're not saying it's a problem to be angry with God. No, it's not a problem, but you know what? God's bigger than all of us. And that that's the next step is recognizing right. who God is. So how, walk us through your process. Cause, and this is something we're also going to make it very clear as well. This is going to look different for everybody. Like I had to like, I like separate myself. I mean, you could, I was, I was angry and I didn't want to take it out on my wife and kids, but I've always known in my heart, like God's bigger than all of us. And I always, as a kid, my, 
my family, my mom would always be like, if you're mad at God, go outside and scream at him, you know, go out in the middle of the field and just start screaming at him. And I used to actually do that. I physically would do that. And I did that out here when, after it was all said and done, I went out and just walk, went for a walk where I hunt and the farm I hunt and just unloaded, you know, like, okay, you're God. Okay. God, you're bigger than all of us. Okay. I'm going to unload on you, but yeah, yes, I'm upset with you, but I still love you. I mean, we all have a savior, you know, that there's called forgiveness and grace. And, you know, and it's trying to remember what God's grace looks like in the anger. And I've gotten past it. I mean, yes, there were days I was, it finally took Tim to be like, Jimmy, you got to let it go. Let the anger go. Just stop being angry and just let it go. And we were in California on our, th our third trip there. He's like, this is the, per he's like, just let it go. And he just started praying. He's like, I want to pray with you. You're my brother. Let's pray. And that was the trend. That was the turning point. Like, so now I'm, it's not even anger at God anymore. It's the discussion for the last year. Okay, God, what do you want? You know, it's not even an anger anymore. It's like it's the frustration, the, yes. the frustration of waiting on, and it's like, it's all in this time. Oh my gosh. If I hear that again, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, know, add so. that to the list of things not to tell people that are <laughs> dealing with stuff. Right. It's just, a, it's a matter of finally letting go and understanding that it's not a God issue. You're not mad at God. You're mad at the situation, but we're all sinful people. It's part of it. You know, it's a sinful world and we just have to, we have to come to terms with knowing in the end where we're going. And so that's where we're going now is that you you've walked through that whole process. You mm -hmm. you've you've dealt with the burnout. You you took the time you needed. You got frustrated with the fact that you were not you felt like you weren't getting the time you needed. And then after you realized you had had the time you needed, then you were frustrated that it wasn't happening fast enough. And now we're towards the middle of that stage. Mm -hmm. What, what has happened? Because the, the, uh, the guy that has created multiple fields across the country and multiple other events suddenly reawoke. Yep. And, and what, what has happened here? Uh, you mean in, in general, it's just, okay. I finally was like, it took my buddy, my read, who's my boss, like, Jimmy, you got to just, it's time, you know, and me and him, have had the, we have a lot of hard conversations because he's going to become a missionary in the other side of the world. And I'm like the church guy who's like, dude, do you know what you're getting yourself into? And he's like, yeah, do you know what you're getting yourself into? And just deep conversations about that. And it's that point of, okay, being quiet and listening to God, just like Reed's trying to do right now. And He's amongst everybody. What are you doing? Why are you leaving? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I'm there like, dude, you're going. God's called you. You got to go. And he looks at me because he's been like, I don't know. I don't know. They're like, I don't know. And everybody's like, you know, they're going to be missionaries. So their families are like, no, we don't want you to go. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, I literally said to him, I'm like, dude, God's called you to go. You're going to go. And he goes, are you calling the kettle black right now? Because God's calling you again to do ministry again. And you're not listening either. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. Yep. You're right. You're so right, buddy. And, you know, and just, which has led to deep, deep conversations. And, you know, that's, it's kind of the transition where I am now. And I know, I feel God is calling me more and more after this last year, especially this last summer. And so, yeah, we're to that place of me and him are both like, okay, we've got to listen to God, but we also have to have that support group of each other. Like, okay, like, what are you going to do? What's next? You know? And I've been asking him like the hard questions, you know, you're going to go to a place where you're going to be like an outsider. You know, and just that kind of stuff. And it's just like that whole transition of like both of us at the same time. Like, okay, if you're going to listen, I have to listen. Because I, I was always like, oh, you're the one going. And every day is like, Jimmy, remember, I'm leaving. So you got to do something else. You might as well just do what God wants you to do because it's the best way for you there is. He goes, you are a ministry person. Get your butt back into ministry kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop fighting it. And like, it just took hearing that from a friend who I trust and not, yeah, I work for him, but me and him are very close friends before I even went to work for him. He was like, our friendship is foremost and more, more than anything. And it's like, okay, let's go. I'm in, I'm listening. And so now let's actually look at what this call is. All right. So this is where the fun part is going to be. So for a little background, before we even get there, for those that have not gone in and looked at, who Jamie Balkum is and what he was looking to do. You need to go back and look at the CSRM episodes that are linked. But the the original plan, the original plan going back five years ago, was that part of what Jamie was hoping to be able to do hmm. was 
teach people how to actually cook meat well. Yeah. That's right. That Hold gonna... that in the back of your head. Yeah. As he do. starts this process of explaining what the vision is that God has now given him. So fire yeah. away, Jamie. So back then it was, I was, I, me and you were here in the conversation starting a podcast about hunting, fishing, barbecuing, and a little bit of Jesus. That's what it was going to be. And, and I just, especially the, it was more of the hunting than anything. And then, but barbecuing, because everybody, everybody can, everybody needs to learn how to cook and barbecuing is huge. And there's not, a, there's not much out there other than the duck dynasty guys, you know, with hunting and, and Jesus. And so I remember that. And, and the point was with you was like, yeah, I want to do that. And then just a whole bunch of stuff fell off the rail and it just couldn't happen. And it just, and as I sit here right now thinking, as I'm watching your face on my computer, it's like, okay, God, here, here's that whole part of God's timing. Like, you know, he, he closed that door at that time. And now was it five years later here? We're sitting right now having this conversation. So it's kind of crazy, but no. So when I moved to Lamar's room right now, my wife actually won the Traeger X uh, uh, at the city yearly expo. She won the Traeger grill. They were given away. And I was like, all right, let's learn how to start smoking stuff. And this has been probably, this is eight years ago, nine years ago now, mm -hmm. almost eight. And I was like, ah, oh, and I started learning how to cook and taking the time. And there's a guy in my town who's a very famous barbecue guy. He has like, at the time, had like 15 different internet shows. He was on every night, you know, and, and he, I went to church with him and became good friends. We still are. He's like my barbecue mentor. And now he's like my, we do crazy stuff all the time now. And so the, so it became a thing. And then we went to California and Compton. And the guys we were staying with the treasurer, they had what was called a pit maker trailer. I don't know. Some of you will know who pit my grill guys are from TV. They had one of their custom made, his custom made trailers. And while we were in Compton, I'm like, man, I want to, I want to do this. I want to do this more. I want to, I want to learn how to cater. I wish, I wish I could have a trailer like yours. And I'm like, what does that trailer cost? They're like $20,000. I'm like, oh my gosh, 20 grand. I'm like I ain't got 20 grand. So as we're out there, this is the, this is where. God came in again, and all of a sudden I was like, hmm, I got a phone call. So a little back farther, my dad died of Agent Orange from Vietnam, you know, after he retired. And all of a sudden I got a phone call, and it's, it's his government number, and I'm like, I don't recognize this number. But anyway, the government decided, because my dad died of Agent Orange, they want to pay me and my brother off. They want to give us money. So I'm like, okay. And then the, the amount was astronomical. Like, not astronomical. It was a lot more than what I ever met, dreamed of, because we were like, oh, it's only like 200 bucks. It's it's astronomical for any of us that have been working in ministry for a right. long time. Astronomical. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, holy crap. And they told my brother, said, did you open the check? I'm like, no, I'm in California. And he's like, well, you might want to have Stacy open it and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, what is it? He tells me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I literally looked, I was with Reed and our friend Riley. I go, I guess I'm going to in a barbecue truck because I just got told how much money I made I'm getting paid off by the government. Might as well. My dad loved to cook and loved how I cook. So I'm like, I might as well honor him. And so I bought a pit maker barbecue truck, which I have today, you know, and I did cater. I've been doing catering on the side, learning how to just barbecue everything there is. I've created a, you know, I've created a community. I've been working in a com barbecue community right now. I'm in with some of the, it's crazy. Like Kent, who my buddy here, Daddy Dutch Barbecue has with all these show guys. I've, I have met some of the most famous barbecue people in the country just because of Kent. And, so that's where I've been doing is just on the side. I just cater and right now I'm catering on the side, doing building houses, catering and getting ready to do some youth group ministry again. But yeah, which is going to lead into what's next. And I truly believe it's what God has called me to do. And that's where this conversation is coming into place is so this summer to make it easy. So this summer we've had out here in Northwest Iowa, I know a lot of people know we've had some massive flooding, just absolutely massive flooding. We've had multiple tornadoes that have never been around this area. So we had a tornado hit, a five tornado hit about two hours south of us in Harland. And I called a bunch of my friends from church. I'm like, hey, let's go. We got to hook up the trailer. The trailer's hooked up. Let's hit Sam's Club. And let's go down. Let's feed people. So we went down to Harland where the F5 tornado hit. We parked. We started cooking. And it really hit us. Like, as we were driving in, Stacy just starts bawling. My wife, I'm like, what are you doing? We, we got to feed people. You can't cry. She's like, but the devastation is... We took all our families, so we all the little ones. We had my little girl, both my daughters with us that are seven and four, and they want us and they're with us and like four families. And we just started feeding people. And as I'm talking to the 
one of the cops, a, a gentleman walked up, an older gentleman. He's like, I need you. He goes to the cop, looks at him. He goes, thank you so much for feeding us. We appreciate this. And he goes, he literally looks at the cop and goes, hey, when you're done hanging out here, can you drive to my neighbors like two miles down the road and tell them to give me my machine sheds back? Because I saw my combines in their field and one of my sheds is by their house. And we're talking, this is like a mile and a half away from where they originally were. And I was like, wow. And then we had a riot doing that. We were doing it. We were feeding people. And then a couple few months later, then we had the giant flood, the August 26th flood. It just, it was insane. We went up north to the city where it hit hardest. One of them, as we were leaving town, I said to Stace, we are not going to get back into Lamar tonight because the flood waters are coming up. And as we were driving up to Orange City, where we go to get everybody and plan stuff, the flood we saw the surge wave in the river next to our town coming down and like we're not getting back into town tonight but we ended up going way south to get back we ended up getting home that night but we went up north and then but that week was like sarah our mission structure is like jamie i need we've got to go feed people i'm like okay well like four or five hundred people that's what we've done a couple times now with the tornado so i'm like yeah and she calls me that night she's like um how about let's plan for like four thousand people can you pull off a meal for four thousand people and i was like uh, you find me an army and a semi. She's like, what? I'm like, we need a semi. And we went down to Sam's club, me and Reed and one other, we took one of the students and we got a semi full of food. We brought it up to church on a Thursday night. And I said, all right, we need an army. We had like 80 people come up. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to get people in place. That next morning we drove up to rock Valley and we served our group alone, served 5,500 meals in one day. And I just got the itch. I'm like, okay, God, is this what you have for me? Is this where we're going? And I have fallen in love with the disaster relief stuff. Um, so I am looking to start an actual disaster relief business. I'm looking, that is my next thing is to do complete disaster relief. So before we get into what the, the plan is, I want, I want you to talk one more, one more area of this. And that is you describe the itch. Walk us through what the itch is, because I know what it is. It's that. Some of our listeners will know what it is, but I want you to describe it, and then I'm going to throw up the wording we use, typically use for the itch. For me, it was the moment that farmer was like, this guy just lost everything he owns. And he had such a sense of humor. He was like, he was laughing. He's like, man, I appreciate you guys feeding us. We prayed with that man right on the spot. But also it was like, he's like, he literally said, you know what? I am 87 years old. I lost everything, but I serve a God who is bigger than all of us. And he will take care of me. And that moment right there, I was like, oh my gosh, we are here because God called us here to feed these people. It wasn't me going, oh, let's go feed him. It was God putting it on my heart. Jamie, to hook up that barbecue trailer. You already have, you have it. Get your butt down and grab some families, call it. And I, the exact people I called it, everybody went. And I was like, one of them might not, they were like, one of them had a wedding. They dropped going to their wedding. The other ones had a family reunion, and they're like, no, we're going with you. This is bigger than us, our families. And we went down, and we served people. We served, like, 500 meals that night, and and it was just that point of, like, okay, I love doing this. It's that point of serving and just being able to pray with people, being able to just give them a, give them a hot meal. You know, then we were doing the flooding. As we were doing the flooding, really, people were walking up that head and showered in five days. We were giving them hot meals. You know, just a smile on their face. We were able to pray with them. We were able to just like, hey, let's talk about how can we support you. And our church has been a huge backing for me and with this idea. And But it's the itch is when you stand there and see people in total loss and you're like, I can help them for that moment. You know, and, introduce, and it's not even feeding them food. It's feeding them a little bit of Jesus. Hey, can I pray for you? Can I take a minute and just... I just want to pray for you. I don't want to push God. on. I'm not going to Bible thump you as people say, that's not my job right now. My job is to, I want, I want to get a warm meal in your belly and let's just take a moment real quick. I just want to pray for you if that's okay. And the, you know, the word we use, or the wording we use for that is the, it's, this is the holy discontent stuff. Yes, sir. My favorite two a, words. A feeling of, uh, you know, this Paul, the, you know, to borrow Paul's phrase, the, the woe to me if I don't. Mm -hmm. with paul it was just straight preach the gospel right for you specifically you know a decade ago it was wiffle ball and baseball cards and now it is shifted to the same same love the same need to provide it is just now shifted in the format right 
and and this is part of the other reason that we're we're talking to you is that the and I think you would agree with me. You can disagree if you want, but I think you probably would agree with me that the the same call and discontent that you had a decade ago doing sports and youth ministry in Michigan, it is still the same heart and call that you are now having as you walk into now switch over into feed his flock. Would that be accurate? No, it's absolutely. It's the same thing. Yeah. So well, yeah. It's- it's the same. There's no doubt. And and again, this is part of what, you know, we keep I keep saying this a bunch, but it's because this is this is also somewhat of the OV radio type of special sort of thing where we're going to be sending this off to CSRM to use as well. But the it, it it is somewhat again of a misunderstanding, misidea for people that have never dealt with this stuff from an actual ministry perspective of the idea of the fact that if you are called into ministry that you're called into specific roles and mm-hmm. only specific roles. And if you're going to switch, then God's got to call you into that. That's not how it actually works. God calls people to specific people, mm-hmm. not to specific areas of ministry. Right. And, you know, so for me, it has always been a marginalized community. Most of the time that has looked as in, at inner city, but not always, because for a while it was in an extremely rural area to the people that were forgotten about in the rural areas. Mm-hmm. You have always been called to the people that just needed a voice, mm-hmm. somebody that was willing to talk to them and, and sit with them and, and work with them where they were at. Mm-hmm. Now let's get into a little bit of the how you plan on doing that now. So you already kind of talked a we, little bit about yeah, we've the already kind of start, we've, yeah, we've started the we started it. That's the crazy thing without really even knowing what we were doing. You know, when I was told I got to find, come up with a meal to feed thousands of people, I was like, this is insane. This there's no way I can do this without by myself. And and I called some people and I'm like, you know, one of my friends, Riley, who runs the, go to church with me, he runs the armory here in, in Lamar's. And he goes to church with us. And I'm like, Hey, I need you to be Riley for a day and a half while we go up here. And he was literally my field general. Like he was like, you do this, you do this. You know, and it was awesome because I could focus on getting everything around. But yeah, the idea for me in the f- going forward is to start literally a disaster relief ministry, but not one like there's all the big ones like Mercy Chef, Samaritan's Purse. They go to the big towns. For me, coming from small small town, little town Conklin, that's where I want to be. Nobody's going to go to the small town in America that gets hit by a tornado. You know, the little towns, you know, like they go to the big ones. Like we had it like Samaritan's Purse and Mercy Chef went to Rock Valley because it was a central point for a bunch of big cities. Me, I want to go to the tiny little towns that are population, what, 300, 400 people for a few days. And we're going to, we're going to feed them. We're going to serve them. And, and that, and you know, and that's where it's and that's where the it's going to start. Is I want to be the one that goes to the little towns. So you you've got the food, you've got the giant truck, you've got mm-hmm. the oh well, not truck, you've got the trailer, not the mm-hmm. not the truck. You've got the you've got the food down, but then you also have a little bit of another advantage in the fact that you just spent the past five years working in in construction as well. You also have the ministry background. You've also got the sports ministry background. Which, when I say that for people that are not part of the CSRM network, they're like, that's the same thing. No, it's not. The sports ministry background and the ministry background are two completely different things. And we might even get into why that is here a little Mm bit. But walk us through what what you're what you're wanting this to look like in terms of you you just said you're going to the small towns you're hoping mm -hmm. to 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 pull in you're hoping to feed the people there you're hoping to be able to also feed the workers there what beyond the food what is it that you're looking to actually do so as i as i start as i right now i'm working on like creating the 501c3 we're starting the process to raise funds to help do it more but like everybody's like well what's your vision and my vision is it's like literally it's all john chapter 21 the whole thing you know but especially the one verse john chapter 21 verse 9 is where where they're coming in off the water with this boat full of fish and there's Jesus and he's standing on the sideline or standing on the side. And it literally says, Jesus lit the charcoal to feed the people. And when you're in the barbecue world, that's a big deal. You light your charcoal to feed people. And 
you know, and it's that idea of like, here, I want to go in to where the people are. We're going to light the charcoal and we're going to feed them. We're going to take the time to feed them. But, but I have learned though, that to do this correctly, because I don't want to go in and do it only partially, you know, I want, we're doing this, we're going to do it right. And so there's a lot of stuff that's got to happen in place. Like I need to come up with funds. Like I've already, I found out with 501c3, you have to have your business plans in place, what you're going to do. But first and foremost is I need a bigger trailer. So I've already reached out to Pitmaker. They've sent me the blueprints to build a new trailer. That's like mine on steroids because I want to be able to go in at one time. If, you, if I can feed 500 to a thousand people in one meal, let's feed 500 to a thousand people right now, you know, per meal. And you know, and then what else do we need? The different equipment we need. And, but you know, it's just like, it's not even necessarily feeding the people the food. It's feeding them who Jesus is. Like I said, like, I want to be able to go in there. We're going to come in. We're going to feed you. We're going to love you. We're going to pray for you. You know, we're going to do that kind of stuff. But also, like, that's just the first phase. My plan is, like, four, three, four phases deep with this whole ministry idea. But also, like you said, my background is sports ministry. Why can't we go in? Why are we feeding them? Let's bring some soccer ball. For me, let's build them a wiffle ball stadium every time we go in. You know, it doesn't cost nothing. You know, give them... Give them a place of hope. Give them a place of, okay, we've just lost everything, but give them a place where they can come together as a community and help them do that process, like to grieve together, but also create a space where, like, hey, we can come together as a community. We can still have fun in our in our biggest loss, you know? And just how to, what is that, like, just for right now, for me, I'm in that phase of, like, what does this transitioning look like? How do I get everybody, you know, what do I got to do? Who's the right people to get in on my team to do it? And, I mean, it's begun. We've done it. We've already started this summer. We've already been feeding people, but now I want to do it full scale. You know, like, here we go. We're going to travel. You know, what's our distance? Like, how far are we going to drive? I don't care if the tornado hits and God says, I got to go to, you know, my, you know, that one place south of the border of Michigan, that town, that state you're in, we're going to come. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Cause you know, them feed them Buckeyes. But, uh, but you know, there's no, I don't want there to be a limit on where we go. If it's a tornado, if it's a flood, if it's an earthquake, if somebody says, Jamie, we, can you come here to our town? If we can do it, we're going to go, you know, okay, team, we got two days. Let's go. Let's get there. We're going to get there in two days. We're going to spend three or four days or a week or a week and a half, whatever it takes to help get this, to feed them and get this town at least at a place where they're like, okay, we can grow. We can come together. We can at least get some food in their bellies for a few days. And then, then who knows where we go next? We either, you know, you come back and get ready for the next one. And, but a lot of that is like, just conversations I've had with people like, okay, this is what I need. But then I'm like, no, this is not what I need. I need, it's huge. It's a humongous because I was like, oh, I can get grants. But then I talked to them. So in my town where I live now, the lady who runs the Red Cross in the five state region lives in my town. And she's like, what do you look for? I'm like, well, I was thinking like a couple hundred thousand just to get started. She's like, a couple hundred thousand, you ain't gonna do nothing with that. She's like, you need a couple million to a few, to two to 10 million to start. I'm like, where am I going to find two? I work in ministry my whole life. Where am I going to find two to $10 million? And she's like, don't you have faith in God? And I'm like, you're right. Can't put God in a box. Can't limit God, you know? And so that's where I'm at is getting to the point now, like, okay, I need to start raising the funds because by next summer I don't have a job, but also I do have, this is what God's calling. I know it. And it's like, all right, how do we set this up? Transition into feeding his flock. So, before we get into what you need from people now, I want us to backtrack a little bit into what you were just talking about. Cause I think it's an interesting thing and we're going to shout out Greg Lindell now because he's going to come up a few times here in this oh, discussion, here we go. whether you, whether you Another knew Greg. it or not, I figured it would. I, I find it interesting that you, you know, feed, feed his flock. You're, you said it's coming out of John 21. Yeah, because I can't Which, do feed the sheep because somebody's already done that one. <laughs> well, yes, but I we're not even going into copyright laws now. You got enough 501c3 stuff to mess with. We're we're dealing with the but the thing that I found interesting was when you said, you know, there's one verse in John 21 that I, that we're focusing on. The verse out of John 21 you're focusing on is not feed my sheep. No, it's the not. verse that you're focused on is the idea of lighting the charcoal. Mm -hmm. Which is Part of what, you know, the, the concern that comes up when you hear sometimes when people are starting these types of ministries is the, the fact that they're going to come in, they're going to throw a meal at people, try to shove the Bible down the throat first, then mm -hmm. feed them, 
and then they leave and everything and they're still in disaster mode. You know, we we've talked about this with this is why CSRM doesn't like the idea of non-indigenous missionaries and things like that because you you go in, you do this stuff and then what you're you leave the town with nothing. Right. But you are coming at it from a little bit of a different perspective here. Uh, the idea of you're just going to light the charcoal and then let God do what he's going to do. Right. I'm there to feed people and pray. That's it. We're not Bible thumping. Anymore. And this is, and this is where I think the the fun part is because I don't know if you are recognizing it or not, but because you you've been out of the CSRM loop a little bit longer, is that we're we're back to the five Bs. Hmm. Of this this whole thing is a model of what the five Bs are supposed to look like because Jamie is very clearly pointing out the fact that the call that he has right now is to come in and make people feel like they belong again, not to make anybody actually believe anything. Right. The goal ultimately is that people will, but that is not the mission that you are set out with. The mission you are set out is to light the charcoal. Right. Plant the seed, be the beacon. And I think that's, and I think that is something that needs to be, highlighted in this discussion especially with with people in my audience because we've all experienced unfortunately the the effects that the church can have when we have it backwards mm -hmm. of we're going to go into a disaster area we're going to go into a trauma-filled area or a trauma-filled discussion and just say well all we need to do is preach the gospel without recognizing what that actually looks like in the case of John 21, the gospel message was we light the charcoal, we let the disciples come up, and then only after that, and Peter's ready, do we actually talk repentance. Mm -hmm. That is what Jesus models in John 21, and that's ideally what we're going to be seeing out of feed his flock here in the future. The other thing that we need to highlight, because people are still probably like, what in the world are they talking about? Let, let's let's sidetrack for a second. Just in, indulge indulge me, and I know you gladly will indulge me on this discussion because you never get tired of it. What do you What are you talking about with the wiffle ball stadiums? Because you just so, said, okay. yeah, you you so, the goal is to leave every town with one. Also, after you feed them, so what I, what is this? Because people are very confused, and I okay, know they so, are. So we all know back in the day, wiffle ball was what I was my way. I totally believed of every sharing Jesus because everybody can play wiffle ball. You can be two years old. You can be a hundred years old. You can play and nobody can get hurt. It's literally baseball. It's literally wiffle ball, like what it's called. And the idea is you create a place where you come together as a community where everybody can be involved. Everybody can play. Man, we used to put on tournaments in our church. We had 70 and 80 year old grandma and grandpas playing wiffle ball tournaments with 12 year old kids. Cause they know they can't get hurt, but it's creating that space of space that everybody can come to that everybody's loved, but also in it, they can create that community. They can come together again as a community in a safe space, you know, and I love using wiffle ball. You know that, and you know that to a fact that it's my favorite. And, but also even if it's other, maybe it's soccer balls, I don't know, but it's creating a space for them to have that safe. You know, here we are. We like, I look at it this way. Like we just, they just get hit by a massive tornado. Obviously there's nothing left. So there's got to be a piece of grass somewhere. All you got to do is put four pieces of place bat and bat and bat and ball, and let's play some ball. You know, every kid played ball growing up. I don't care who you are. Everybody played it at some point in their life, and just creating that space, like, hey, this is a space that's safe. Come here, come. Let's just hang out. And it has nothing to do with like, me, yeah, we're gonna maybe set up a wiffle ball field, but it doesn't mean we're gonna preach the gospel to you. It's we're just gonna love you. We're gonna we're gonna earn. You know, we're gonna be a part of who you are. You know, we want to show you that unconditional love. And so now the big question is what, because like you said, you're, you're in the, the planning stages. Well, you're past planning stages. You're in the more of the secondary planning stages. Yeah, it's let's get the paperwork together. What, what is it that you need from people right now to be able to, to get, get moving? Are you looking for volunteers? Are you looking for financing? Are you looking for prayers? Are you looking for sponsors? Yeah, what, always, what is it that always, you need right now? Always, always, always first and foremost is prayer. 
this is a huge, huge undertaking. Like I, we did the 5,000 meals in one day. I was so tired after that day. I was like, I don't want to do this again. But then it was like, okay, <laughs> no, this is what we, this is what God's calling me to do next. You know, and if it's for me doing it for a few years or what it is, but for right now, this is like, you talk about that transition window and this is where I'm at. And I truly believe this is what God is calling for me in this transition time is to do this and to travel. And like, this is where we're going. And I think for me, it starts with always with prayer. Prayer is the most important. Everybody knows that. You know, and like, okay, God, but yeah, it's the, it's the financial support. I don't want to get grants, but I don't want to go into a town and have a kid walk up or an adult walk up and says, I don't have any, I am, I'm hungry and I run out of food. I don't want to run out of food when I go into a town. And it's just, it's a huge financial, it's like trying to find the money to get every the equipment all up front that I need. Like right now I'm in the point like, okay, yes, I want to start the 501c3 so I can at least get the money in to cover the trailer just because it takes nine months for them guys to build a trailer. So, I mean, I'm already, we're already what September. So it means it's the middle of June next year. I'm sure when they know what's going on, George does, he'll, he might make it a little quicker, but it's a six to eight month to get the trailers built, get it made, get it. And, you know, and it's just getting the equipment right now. And eventually it's going to be, I need the volunteers. Hey, here we come, you know, like Andrew, I'm coming to Ohio. You better, you better find me an army. We're going to go to this town that just got hit and let's, let's reach out and get people or, you know, but it's, it's right now, it's literally the prayers and getting the finances coming in. And I mean, I got to get the 501c3. So if you know a, a lawyer or an accountant, that'd be awesome too. I mean, I think I have one figured out out here, but I mean, but the other hard part is because it's a disaster team, it's, it's multiple states. Like, mm-hmm. yes, I got to set it up here, but I also have to go talk to other states too. And it's just, it's just finding the time, like, the hard part is I have a full-time job and I want to do this full-time, but until I get finances in, I can't just, you know, like it's getting to that point. Like, yes, I want to cover where I'm fully like part of it is yes. It'll fund me as a full-time job, you know, cause it's ministry cause it'll be full-time for me fundraising and disaster relief and travel. And there's a ton of travel in it for me. Cause I have to, I've already gotten some sponsorships starting to come in for it. You know, like charcoal, I teamed up with fireball charcoal out of, Florida, they are like all in for the charcoal that I need, but it's just that financial beginnings to, okay, let's go because people are, cause, cause I'm telling you right now, a tornado is going to hit somewhere tomorrow. There's going to be a tornado Mm -hmm. the next day. There's going to be a flood. It never stops. So it's getting the sooner I get money in the bank for this, the sooner I can really get going, you know, and starting to pray for the right people. Like I'm going to have to hire a couple of chefs and a couple of people because I can't just do all the cooking myself, but it's also just praying that God starts putting everything in place he's going to open and close every door that needs to be open and closed yes i'm accepting his call to go do this but now you know the argument with god okay god it's your turn what do you got but i'm not going to be the first one i'm not going to put god in a box if god says here you go you're going to this is going to blow up like there's no tomorrow but also i don't want to be so big that it's still not i can't be a part of it because i still want to go to every town and cook with the crew even though i you know does that make sense like I want to be just as big a deal in it as going like, Hey, I want to be a part of it. Hey, let's go into this town. Let's support people. That's my heart is giving the people the support. It's not sitting in an office. That's not me. You know that. That's why I do youth and sports ministry. I don't want to sit still. I hate being inside. So, but it's the idea right now. It's figuring out prayer and figuring out where the finances are coming. Like I'm literally trying to budget it with, with probably two and a half million dollar a year start is where I'm looking. If I could, but I got to find it. I don't want to do you. I don't want to do grants. I don't want the government to hold it against me. You know, I have the training. I am in the, you know, I'm at the place where I can, you know, like I have it all laid out on paper, what I, what each thing costs already, you know, and just trying to figure it out. And then the other thing is event. And, you know, that's just the first phase. There's two other phases coming, which we don't have time to talk about right now, but there's two more phases in the whole. I'm ministry. sure you'll be back. Yes. And, but the first phase is getting going is getting the first, you know, I, I know it's a big number. I'm just saying two and a half, two and a half, three million. It's a huge number. I've, it's astronomical in my head, but to do it correctly, that's where it's at. And then if it, like, if we have money left, cause I mean, a million dollars alone of it is food for like, that's just five, six months of feeding a town of 500 to a thousand people. You're looking at a million dollars in food for five, six months. We'll put that into perspective. You're just like, holy crap, you know, like, oh my gosh, I need a million dollars just to buy. Like, I think about every Sam's Club I'm going to walk into and have to write checks <laughs> for ten, fifteen thousand dollars every day, you know. But mm-hmm. you want to, and I also, and a part of it is like Mercy Chefs. I love their ideas. You want to have color. You, I want people to open that box and know it's not just a cheap meal. It has to be nourishing. It has to be. It has to be like I want to eat it. 
Like I want to go, oh my gosh, this is a really good meal. I'm going to eat this whole thing, you know, and creating what all that looks like. And you can't do that with garbage food. I want to give people the best meal I can feed them. You know, so it's, that's where I'm at. It's just right now, it's like, okay, God, I need $3 million as soon as possible so I can, one, order the trailer, order a new truck, order a refrigerator truck, get a building, because I'm going to need a warehouse. And it's possibly, if it gets big enough, I need warehouses and kitchens in three different states. You mm-hmm. know, and then teaming up with churches, okay, I'm going to come into your town. Who's got the biggest kitchen of a church that we can we can stay at? Where's the closest hotels? Because I'm going to, because I know... It was like hotels. I'm like, yes, I want to put my people that are working for me in a hotel. One, I don't have to feed them breakfast. They get a warm meal for breakfast, but also they get a good bed to sleep in. They have the energy every day to do this every day because we're going to see people in their lowest of lows. And you have to be able to be like, okay, these people have lost everything. We need in their sadness. We're that light. We're that beacon of light that's been lit to be like, hey, let's put a smile back on their face. Let's get a warm meal in their belly. And, and that that last part is something that is again, something that people don't realize until they've had to do it, that it takes a certain type of person to be able to deal with these sort of situations. Mm -hmm. Um, In many cases, it is actually something that we would even be able to classify as it's a spiritual gifting to be able Mm -hmm. to do it. Right. But it's one that takes its toll. Just like we talked about the beginning with the burnout. This is another area where burnout can happen if you are not properly taking care of yourself. And that's part of it too. And for so me, is how people... can, go ahead. I was going to say, how can people get in touch with you if they want to be able to either follow along or they, they know of somebody in some of these States that you're looking to get into um, churches that want to get involved, things like that. How, how can people get a hold of you? So right now you can just get a hold of me through, you know, through my email with right now because we're still in the process of getting everything ready i'm going to try to bu- hopefully have a website start getting built in the next couple of weeks uh you can follow me because i do barbecue stuff on instagram and facebook at crackling coals i mean it's hashtag crackling coals that's my barbecue company and like everything's going to be like it's going to be feed feed his flock a minute and a ministry outreach of crackling coals so i mean it's hashtag crackling coals that's my instagram where you can look up crackling coals you can look me up you can i mean there's ways to find me. You can email me. You can call me. I mean, I mean, that's just it right now. It's just, I don't care. I just need prayers. And yeah, and it's just the support. Like, Hey, I'm having a, like for me, like, holy crap, I'm running this multi-million dollar ministry. I need a break. I need somebody to just vent with, have the right people to talk to, but also, you know, it's creating a team and a, that also supportive of my staff and whoever I haul take. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, but I want, and if somebody wants to volunteer when we get to a town, heck yeah, let's go. You know, like, I can't say, and knowing now, like, I can't say yes to every town. Yes, tornadoes hit everywhere. I have to, I need people to pray that God gives me the right towns to go to. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Jamie, you're going here. I know this feeling, like, everybody's going, oh, we hit a drone. We need, okay, God, I need to be able to decipher where we're going and be okay with that. Because me, I want to go in every town there is. Because that's who my heart is. Which, like, again, oh. yeah, again, that's another one of those areas where the, the, the idea of having to say no is hard is hard especially for people like you and i right no doesn't exist in Uh, my book yes now um he gave you a bunch of different places you can find him you can find all of those in his guest portal on our website as well um, and we'll be doing updates and things like that um, to be able to, to find out about all of that. So for the CSRM people, if you go to ministrymisfits.org, or, or min- wow, I just screwed that up. It's okay. If you go to ministrymisfits.com and go to the resources tab, and under the resources, you click on guests, and then you just find Jamie, which he should be towards the top since he's a B, but um, you should be able to find find him. And then if you click on his his uh, portal, then it'll bring up all the links to his different stuff there. Um, so yeah, ministrymisfits.com. Do what? You can, add, you can add my phone numbers to that list too. I mean, I'm easy to get along with. Sounds good to me. So yeah, you'll be able to find all of that on the website here pretty soon. Um, and then we will definitely be keeping everybody updated as this moves forward. Um, and, and looking to, to get this off the ground and everything like that. So, um, in the meantime though, um, misfit wise, if you want to support the show, you can do so by going to patreon.com backslash Mr. Misfits, um, on 
there you can get all sorts of different stuff from the um, Patreon exclusive Bible studies to some of the episodes releasing early to early access to the blogs, as well as some exclusive merchandise, things like that. Um, so patreon.com backslash ministry misfits. Jamie, thank you for doing this, for getting up early for, uh, I needed it. I needed to see your face. Yes. You're one of the few that, that actually says that genuinely. So <laughs> we, we, I'm sure you'll be back. We'll be keeping everybody up to date on what's going on and we will see the rest of you next week. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers, and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits. 